They want you How to sit you? right How there. are you, Dave? Great. It's a real, Good. it's a true pleasure. Yeah, you're losing to get your to quarterback. You. You're losing your quarterback. I hear. We lost our quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Are I we think, getting? Him? I think we're losing our basketball are coach you? today. <laughs> Listen, I, it wasn't me. That's how I got into this business, you know. You guys arrested me when I was 16. <laughs> Threw me in the Marine Corps. Dallas's finest. <laughs> how are you? I'm great. It's good I to can, be here. I, there's so many places we could start. The three wins here, all your relationships. I see the two Dargy see, brothers. I know you had a great I, relationship with Bert. I, I had, this was the greatest relationship that I've ever had with a man. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a, I mean, this. <laughs> This guy was absolutely one of the closest friends I've ever had, simply because he loved, he loved what I loved, not, not in the playing aspect of, of, of the sport. He, he was a genius in the club making. And I pride myself in knowing a little something about golf clubs and being able to soup them up and, and, and know exactly where the weights should be for the ball to go different directions. You know, the thing about people that play golf today, you have to understand that the golf clubs are made for the masses. And golf clubs are, everyone that plays golf swings at a little bit different, loads up a little bit different, releases in a different spot, stands differently, takes it back differently. And with all that, there are certain shafts, certain weighted clubs, certain spots on a golf club that you should have the weight on. To, to compensate for that particular golf swing. And, and you can't get that simply because they're manufactured for the masses. And I'm the one that dissects all these things. Now, Arnold Palmer has actually ruined more clubs than I have. <laughs> he, uh, Mr. Palmer did the same thing. He absolutely, Mr. Palmer liked to hit down on the ball, so he caught the ball on the heel all the time. So if you look at his golf clubs, if you ever have a chance, go to Pittsburgh uh, and, and, and Latrobe, and he has a huge museum there, and all his drivers. Arnie is never, he's, a, he's actually a hoarder uh, but in golf clubs, but he has them, they're, they're all displayed, and they're not just piled up. He'll have a wall, and he'll have all drivers sticking in this wall, and he might have two, 3,000 of them. <laughs> and if you look at the wooden drivers, every one of them have the heel <laughs> shaved off. Because when he came down into the ball at that angle, down, he always caught the ball on the heel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he always did this. But Bert Dargie was the first gentleman that I ran into that actually knew something, in other words, a, a, about a golf club and how to do it. And he had a, a crew in the back there and, and that did all my golf clubs. I had leather grips, lampkin grips, came out of New Jersey. And, and it, when I won the Open in 68, I had seven different makes of clubs in my bag. None of the shafts matched. And that was before they had the rule to where you had to have a straight shaft five inches uh, from the bottom of the club. The club had to be straight. Uh, we'd hook a ball, hell, we'd, mm, we'd, we'd, put that, we'd, put that knee, we'd put that knee on that shaft, that thing looked like a bow the next time you hit this five iron to lag, to lag it a little bit. But he was, his dad was the first one that did this for me. And, and we, would, we would come in on Monday. It was, it was just a, a game. I looked forward to it. I remember winning Colonial in Fort Worth, and I couldn't wait. I cut the press conference short because I wanted to run to get on the plane to come to Memphis because we were going to party, Bert and I. <laughs> and and we, we would go to his shop on a Monday morning. I'd play a practice round here in Germantown, and I'd play a practice round. And then I would, I would at two o'clock I would meet Bert at, at his office at, 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 the, at, the, at the golf place, and we would lock the door and we'd send someone to get about four or five cases of beer, <laughs> and we would sit there and he would eat cigars and we'd drink Coors. I mean, I brought some Coors one time when you couldn't bring it across, you know, across the right. river, and I brought some down and, and and we would discuss golf, and they would have my clubs in the back. The only person. It's the only person in my whole career that I would ever let touch my golf clubs. The my only golf guy? clubs traveled with me everywhere. I took them home. They laid right next to the bed. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I never left my golf clubs. 
In other words, till today, my wife will tell you, I will drive to the golf course, I'll come back, I take my clubs out of the car, and I'm going to take them in the morning. I put them in the garage, and then every, when I get bored in the house, something, I go out in the garage, I put a glove on, and I wiggle them a little bit, <laughs> and I put them back in. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, I, I, I'm just, uh, I love this game. I, I really do. This is... Uh, I'm, I'm having a, uh, not a hard time uh, with it right now. I'm going to be 77 this year, and, uh, and I'm not competitive anymore, but I can still play. And if you don't think so, just put me on the up tees and come on. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for you. See, so <laughs> just, uh, just give me a little, little shorter course, and come on. I play every day. You have so many connections to Memphis, but I, I, I want yeah. you to look to your right. I yeah. want you to see that picture yes. from 1971. You right. got an unbelievable honor yesterday. Yeah. It was already alluded yeah. to, but this is the first time this award has ever been given. It was given to him, and it's named after him yeah. for people who have unwavering generosity and support uh -huh. to St. Jude. And this is now in your honor. What does that yeah. mean? Well, I, it, it just it, it, I wasn't expecting this, and I wasn't doing this. Uh, trying to get an award. Uh, I did what I did for St. Jude, I did because I wanted to do it. It wasn't because I was asked to do it or, 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 or I thought I was going to find a better place in heaven if I did it. When you give a donation to your church, your pastor, whomever you give it to, you do this with the goodness of your heart because you want to. Not because you have to, and you say, oh, God, this guy over here is, 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 is giving. I better do this same. And don't do that. If you don't want to give it, don't give it. But, but, but this, is, this is exactly what I did. Danny Thomas and I were very good friends. We played a lot of golf together in the Bob Hope Golf Classic. I remember his story very well, and I'm not going to bother you with it because you've probably heard it, and how he got all started with mm -hmm. this thing. Actually got started with a Catholic priest. Uh, and, uh, and he's in, uh, in Chicago, and he was down and out, and he went to the church to pray. He gave the priest two-thirds of the money he had in his pocket. That's all he had. They prayed together. The next day, he gets a toothpaste commercial. The next day, and that's where he got his start. Became a very wealthy man and, and, and very charitable. And he started this because of the Catholic priest. Uh, at the time, the way I heard it, at the time the Catholic priest had come south uh, and there was a lot of discrimination on some of these kids getting into hospitals and being treated. And the priest said, I mean, I mean, I mean he, grew up, he grew up, as you well know, in Ohio and, and then ended up in Chicago. And, and uh, so what he did was, was, was the priest says, what can I do for you? It's what Danny said to the priest. And the priest says, I'll let you know someday. And then one day the priest retired and says, I want to build a children's hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Hmm. I want to go to the South. And this is exactly what happened. I started going there the first year I was here when I won in 1971. I promised him that I'd donate 5000 if I won the tournament. I won the tournament. I won it in 72. Finished second in 73 and still donated the 1000 The biggest, the biggest, I guess, chunk of money that I've, I've, I've done outings. Uh, Joe Hager, good friend of mine, uh, owned the Hager Slack Company, passed away about five years ago. Joe Jr. is not doing very well. We have a very big golf outing every year in Dallas, maybe 500 players, 36 holes, morning, afternoon, tea time. The dinner one, one year, uh, Jerry Jones was gracious enough to, uh, to give us uh, the stadium to have dinner on the wow. field, uh, and it was, it was very exciting. But it takes, when I came here and participated with St. Jude, it took less than a million dollars a year. We had a four-story building. Now it takes two and a half million dollars a day, in other words, to open it. I went there to tour it yesterday. I did not recognize it. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And, and, and they're doing a phenomenal job there. You know, when, we, when he first started this hospital, and I spent a lot of time with him, we were losing four out of five kids. They were coming there. We were trying to treat them, but we we're losing them. Now we're saving four out of five. Sometimes five out of five. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just phenomenal yeah. what we're doing. There. But uh, he was a he was a saint. Uh, he was a saint. Again, why did he do it? Because he wanted to. It wasn't because he had to. It's because he wanted to. 
And uh, this is when I got involved with this. And, and uh, I, I didn't, uh, very emotional when I saw this yesterday. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Um, but he's, I guess he, he, he did well, you know. I, I had a, an experience also with Guy Yoakum, as you, some of you people read Goth Digest. Guy Yoakum is a writer for Goth Digest, and he called me. I don't know, my wife probably remembers 10 or 12 years ago or eight years ago. And his daughter had a brain tumor. And she had actually been diagnosed already and treated, I think, up in, Chicago, up in New York. And one of the things that St. Jude likes is when a, a child has cancer or any disease, they want to get them fresh. They want to start treating them their way. And I called and, and, and had to talk to some different people. And then they finally, because of what I've done for St. Jude, they, we, we brought them in here. But... Um, I think you reminded him you gave him a half a million dollars from the well, whole one, right? I gave him a lump sum of a half a million. Uh, uh, I don't remember when it was I was playing. Every tournament that I play in, when we have skins games or whatever, a lot of golf tournaments in this country, professional tournaments, will say to you, okay, we, we're going to play for this, but 20% of this is going to a charity. Who do you want it to go to? And I always put St. Jude down. And uh, so I, I, all the skins games that I played in, in, in California and, and everywhere, they always got 20% of my winning. But I made a hole in one uh, up in Michigan when we were having a tournament. And there was a million dollar prize uh, for this hole in one. And so they said to me, they said, if you make a hole in one, how, what charities do you want to, do your 20% to go? And I said, St. Jude. And then I made the hole in one, and I said, the heck with it. I'm going to give them half of it. And uh, so I, I sent them half. It was so funny because it was on the news that evening that I had donated 500000 to St. Jude. And actually, the, 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 the gentleman from St. Jude called my office and said, is this true? Is this a hoax? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, it's true. It's true. He's giving you a half a million dollars. Yeah. You've had many incredible moments in your yeah. life, but I want to go to one that I think was life-changing. You mentioned it a little yesterday. Let's go to 1975, Chicago, and you are hit by lightning, and that puts a whole new perspective on, on your attitude. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was, had my eyes closed, and I was listening to Reverend Foster there just for a moment, and, and I was very, uh, very moved by it because there is a time in your life that uh, I don't know if it's, uh, you're going to be saved or, or, or what, but you, you start realizing that uh, there was a maker, uh, and, and that's why you're here. And we have a, a we, uh, sometimes in life we forget that. We, we start rushing around and running and take everything for granted and, and, and don't really realize that, that, that someone put us here and, and they put us here for a purpose. And yes, I got my, my bell rung in 1975 uh, and I was on the 13th green at Butler. I'll never forget it. Everything was in threes. That's my favorite number. And, uh, and, and so I, it was a par three. It was at three o'clock. Uh, I hit six iron, double three, three feet. And uh, so I, I, at that time, we did not have alarm systems for electrical, uh, in other words, uh, any kind of electrical storm. At that time, you just, you, you heard thunder or something, they would sound a siren and you'd go in. And it was kind of hazy and cloudy and the clouds were a little low and all of a sudden, uh, it started lightning and thundering and they said, okay, they blew up the siren. Well, it didn't look that bad, so Jerry Hurt and I, <laughs> It, it, Jerry Hurd and I and Mike Fetchick, we walked down to the 13th hole because you cannot, when they, when they suspend a, a tournament, you cannot leave your golf ball on the green, on the course without marking it. Even though someone may steal your marker or pick it up, in, in other words, uh, you, you still know approximately in the area your ball's mm -hmm. at. If the marker's not there, you drop it, you see. And so we go down and we mark the ball. So I said, you know, this doesn't look bad. So dumb me, there's a lake, huge lake right there. And it's not very far away. So we put the bags down, we sat on the bag. Well, lightning bolt hit that lake. And those rays came off that, that thing and knocked me colder than a cucumber. And knocked, uh, uh, Jerry Hurd didn't knock him out, but it, it, he never played again. Hmm. And it ripped his back out. And, uh, and so he never had it fixed. I've had four back operations. I have two steel rollers in my back. I have a steel plate in my throat. And it didn't slow me down one bit, not one bit. I, I, uh, I had all that put in, and I, I think I won 18 months later, I won uh, the Canadian Open again. But um, I saw the second coming. And I, I, uh, I, I saw uh, 
no disrespect to, to, to Reverend Foster, I saw management, not, not sales. You yeah. understand? Uh, I actually saw... Uh, I, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but I got to tell you another story about that in a moment. So uh, I, I saw management, and it was wonderful. It was the greatest feeling. And I tell people, when I see people that are ill, and they're not doing well, and uh, I, I tell them, I said, listen, don't be afraid of it. I've been there. It was great. It was a great feeling. It was warm. I was at peace. It was the greatest feeling I ever had in my life. And I said, I don't want to go, but I'm not scared. I'm not scared one, one little bit. But, but saying that, it was so funny. I'm in the locker room at Preston Trails here about two and a half months ago, and President Bush was there. And uh, we play golf together all the time. I, I see him. He comes out and plays two or three times a week. So we're sitting there, and I'm sitting in, in the kind of a little lounge with a TV on, and it started raining outside. So I'm reading the paper, and all of a sudden, four or five guys come in, and they sit down. And you know, golfers, we, we, we're like, we, we're old ex-Marines and stuff with a foul mouth, you know. I'm telling all these off-color jokes and stuff and everything. President Bush walks in, and he says, Lee, he said, you know, he said, that's Reverend so-and-so from the Baptist <laughs> Church here. And you know, I'm pretty quick. I, I, I'm pretty quick. And I said, that's the only reason he's in business, for guys like me. I said, <laughs> I, <laughs> well, and, didn't and I never even slowed down, Reverend. I just kept telling it. <laughs> I was wondering why he wasn't laughing. These were funny <laughs> stuff. I was, I was talking. I was doing some funny stuff over there, and he wasn't laughing one bit. And I, he was the big pastor there. So I said, oh, Lord, oh, God. I said, that's why you're in business, saving guys. If it wasn't for guys like me, you'd be out of business. Huh? Everybody have a church in their house, you know. <laughs> didn't, didn't you, like, tempt uh, the lightning? Because I think you were the guy that coined the phrase, I, if it's lightning out, I just hold up a one iron well, because even God can't hit know, a one iron. I, 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 I tell you what, you are exactly right because I'm going to tell you something. God is listening to you. Now, I, I'm telling you something. He is listening to you, and I'm going to tell you why, and here's proof of it. The week before we had the tournament at Medina was the U.S. Open. The week after was the Western Open at Butler. We had two tournaments in a row. We stayed in the same hotel, the Drake or something there. Yeah. And so we're staying at the same hotel, and we're just driving over to Medina, and we're playing. On a Friday about 10 o'clock, I'm teeing off the first hole. There's 20,000 people around this tee, being the clown that I am. You know, and, and he says, see, I'm a 77-year-old guy living in a 15-year-old body. You know, I mean, I'm, I've never changed. So all of a sudden, I'm standing there, and the siren goes up because there's lightning in the air. So there was an assistant that comes in out of the clubhouse to get me off the first tee. And he says to me, he says, listen, he says, you've got to go in the clubhouse because there's lightning in the area. So you know me, I'm loudly with the 15,000 people. I say, well, what are you going to do with my fan? Are they going to go in with me too? And they said, no, they just told me to come and get you. I said, just come. Uh, the hell with them, huh? I mean, you yeah. just not going to. If they get hit, we just, what? Just uh, stroll them off, right? So I said, well, Mr. Trevino, they just told me to get you. I said, don't worry about it. It's exactly what I said to him. I said, don't worry about it, because I needed to laugh right about then. I says, I pulled out the one iron. I said, I just hold up the one iron. I says, because God can't even hit a one iron. <laughs> the next week, he zapped me. <laughs> he said, he said, I might not be able to hit a one iron, but I love little Mexican boys. I tell you. <laughs> he zapped me, boy. And I'll tell you what, that has stuck with me. I've told that story a million times, and it's the gospel truth. It's exactly what I did. I ah, you can't hit a one iron. Shh. People say that to me all the time. I, I tell them, you know what, I, I deny it. I said, no, it wasn't me. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you go, going back to the Memphis connections here. Sure. You, you won at the old, old colonial. Yeah, the old colonial. And then the new colonial. Yeah. And Curtis Person was all, all a My part Betty. of that. I, I don't know if you... My buddy. Were, did you ever hang out with Dr. Kerry Middlecoff? Or what was... I did, I, do you know, I met him once. Never knew him. Uh, I met him once. He was too slow for me. I couldn't play golf with him. 
<laughs> I mean, he'd dip, he'd dip 18 times in a bunker. He'd thin it in a bunker, he'd go. <laughs> I said, man, hit the damn thing, man. No, I, I can't. You, see, I, I love Jason Day. He's a hell of a player. Couldn't play with him. <sighs> now, see, he prays every shot, uh, Reverend. I mean, I don't know who his priest is, but uh, his preacher is, but he prays every shot this kid. Yesterday, yesterday the Lord must have gone to get a sandwich because that last, that, last, that last five holes killed him. I'm going to tell you who. Uh, really killed him. That five shot. You can't, you can't win a Masters if you make a triple bogey, you know, even a double bogey. It's a very difficult. It, it, Masters is a, is a very difficult golf course to get something back. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, it's yeah. To get something back. Here he was four or five under par, and all of a sudden he finished, what, even or something? Mm -hmm. uh, even. Yeah. But I did not play with Dr. Kerry Middlecoff. Hell of a player. A lot of people really don't realize how many golf tournaments he won. He won 40-something golf tournaments. Uh, it was a, a Lloyd Mangrum won a bunch of golf tournaments. I'm the one that got him in the Hall of Fame. Uh, no one was, uh, he wasn't getting in the Hall of Fame. And uh, they were keeping him out. Tommy Bolt, Thunderbolt. Yeah. I got him in the Hall Arkansas. of Fame. I mean, he was qualified. Um, but um, uh, it, it, it's been one of the greatest careers that anyone could have. I mean, it was, I, I was, it was habit, I was, I was watching the houses here and, and, and I'm looking over there and I'm thinking at these houses and how these shotgun type houses, they were there. If I'd have grew up in something like that, hell, I'd still be there. That was good. That would have been really great. I mean, uh, the house that I grew up in didn't have any plumbing, electricity, four room house uh, in the middle of a cow pasture. And I was raised by my grandfather and uh, I didn't even I didn't know anything about golf, uh, nothing. I didn't pursue it. There was a golf course next door. My uncle was caddying, and I started uh, shagging golf balls and looking for balls and selling balls. And then at the age of 16, I got in a little trouble, and uh, these guys in a dark suit with all that stuff, uh, I borrowed some hubcaps from a guy. And uh, <laughs> that's when they had hubcaps. So you don't have to worry about that now. These cars don't have hubcaps. So they steal the whole car now. We, we, we were the hubcap guys. And so we could take the radio and leave the music. We, we didn't do any of that stuff. And so they asked me, when are you going to be 17? I said, two weeks. And they took me down to the Marine Corps recruiter. And uh, there I went, four years, 56 to, 56 to 60. Now you and played in the Marine Corps, didn't you? I, I did. I, I played two years. I was the only corporal that, that had a that had a staff car with a, with a star on it. Everybody was saluting me because the general, I was the best enlisted player there on the base and the general wanted a partner that could play okay they were betting 50 cents you see and so 50 cents and a buck and he would pick me up in his staff car and we'd go to Owasi Meadows in Okinawa and uh, and, and play I carried uh, I carried a, but before I started playing the last two years I was in the, I was uh, a machine gunner yeah I was mm. a 330 in the jungle there all over yeah mm. but that was way that was before, that was before Vietnam uh, and stuff. We were just training. I was never in combat. Uh, if, I, if I'd have been in combat, I'd be dead because I was crazy. <laughs> you know, I didn't, it didn't wouldn't have made any difference really. <laughs> you get out, and all of a sudden, how do you wind up? Didn't being pursue club, it. I, I knew nothing about golf. I played a little bit in the Marine Corps, and I, I, I didn't know what kind of a player I was. But I got when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to work on a construction crew building a golf course and uh, kept my hand in it. And then we would play in the afternoon uh, uh, at, at a different course there, and I was beating everybody and winning a few quarters and a few 50 cent pieces and stuff. And then I, I was, I, I, one Friday afternoon, about five o'clock when I finished playing, I looked at the first fairway, it was a Jewish club. And I looked at the first fairway, and it was a Colombian club, we have 18 holes now, building a new course there, we ripped it up, and now it's under construction now. But I looked at the first fairway and it hadn't been mowed. And I was on that crew. And I said, this is baloney. So I went to the maintenance barn, cranked up a tractor, hooked up five gang more, and I started mowing the fairway. You know, just on my own, six o'clock in the afternoon. And this gentleman walks across the, the uh, fairway there and it leans on the tire track, uh, on, the, on, the, on the tire. And he says, is this what you're gonna do the rest of your life? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm 21 years old. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not married and drinking a few beers, raising hell. I said, he said, uh, you know, he said, I watched you hit golf balls at my driving range. And Hardy Greenwood, he had a driving range and a par three course. And he says, 
boy, you look like you got some potential. And I don't know, I, I tell people all the time, I said, potential means you hadn't done it yet. That's all it does. <laughs> you ain't done anything yet. So I said, smartest thing I ever did. And I quit my job and I went to work for him. I ran a driving range and a par three. I alternated running the businesses. But the thing that I got to do is I got to practice. And I didn't come to work till two. So that gave me a chance to play golf every morning. And every morning I'd go to the golf course and I'd play. And no one could beat me. Now I can say that the God's truth. It never took a lesson, right? No. No one could beat me. And every one that I played, I ran right, right over them. And the first, that was in 1961. And the first tournament I ever entered, pro or amateur, never played in a tournament before, was the Texas State Open in Sharpstown in Houston, Texas. And I went there in 1965. So I had been practicing four years hitting golf balls and gambling, and I won it in a playoff. And I won the tournament in a playoff, and I won $1,000, I'll never forget it, and then two months later I won the New Mexico Open. Hmm. And then I came back and defended and won. I beat all the boys from Houston University. Coach Williams had the, the hottest team in the, in the nation at the time. You know, Marty Fleckman and Homero Blancas, and ran right over, ran right over. And then I won the New Mexico Open again twice, and in 66, I went to the Open at, uh, in San Francisco where Palmer, remember, blew the seven-shot lead? In, in, uh, Mr. Palmer, sorry. And uh, he blew the seven-shot lead to Billy Casper. And I finished 53rd in that tournament, played again in, in 67, finished fifth at Boulderstraw. And that gave me some exemptions, uh, in other words. So I started, I started in, in Minneapolis-St. Paul. I'll never forget that. It's the only time... The only time that I ever had to qualify on the PJ Tour was, 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 uh, uh, was at Hazeltine, which was a monster back then. Because all the courses now, that, that course is easy compared to the one they have now. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this was a monster, you know, uh, and Trent Jones had built it. That's the one that Dave Hill called it a, a cornfield, you remember? Yeah. And, and, and so I went there, and it was a qualifying on Monday. That's when everybody qualified on Monday. We'll call us, they called us rabbits. And I remember shooting 78, and mm -hmm. I was packing my car in the parking lot, and Wade Cagle, which was the official, comes by, and he called me Pinto Bean. That's what my nickname. <laughs> he said, hey, Pinto Bean. He says, uh, this is for, Reverend, this for discrimination wasn't in. <laughs> you know, nobody, <laughs> nobody gave a damn back then, you know. <laughs> but it, <laughs> so he called me Pinto Bean. Ain't no way you call me Pinto Bean now, <laughs> you know. But anyway, so he called me Pinto Bean, and I said, you all right? So he says to me, he says, uh, where are you going? I said, man, I said, I shot 78. He said, hell, you're leading. <laughs> <laughs> so I made, I made the tournament and I made the cut. And that year, in that year, at that time, the PGA owned the tour. And if you made the cut in the tournament, you were a class A professional, you were automatically in the next tournament. So I kept going. And I didn't miss the cut the rest of the year. So I ended up playing 13 tournaments. I won all of them. $33,000. Big money then? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Won Rookie of the Year. But most of all, I finished 47th on the money list, which was 60, was the, was the uh, cutoff. Was the cutoff. 60 was the exempt number. And in the next year, naturally, I, I win the U.S. Open. And at that time, the PGA had a rule that if you win the U.S. Open or the, U, or the, uh, or the PGA before 1970, you had a lifetime exemption. I can play over there now. You know, but uh, I'm, I, I mean, what, is that the greatest yeah. gift you can get? Yes. Is a lifetime, are you kidding me? <laughs> they got tournaments over there now that if you miss the cut, you make more money than most of you that are sitting in here. <laughs> just off that one tournament. I mean, that Cadillac one, what, uh, that they just played in Durrell, I think, one of those tournaments is 70,000, last, last place. Man, I drank a lot. Dargy and I would have had a hell of a time playing. <laughs> <laughs> we had never finished. Your rivalry began with Jack right then and there, and that was how it was in the early 70s. Mm. So what was your relationship like with him? And, and you got to tell the snake story. Well, he was absolutely the greatest competitor ever. This, this, guy, this guy was way beyond his time. I mean, he, he would be hell right now. I mean... If, if you uh, th there's a little clip 
in the latest Golf Digest, you look in there. In 1962, he won the long drive contest at the PGA. Now listen to this. With that X shaft, dynamic, weighed 140 grams, 11 degree persimmon driver, 43 inches long, right? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how the Golden Bear could hit it. 341. In 61? 62. 62? Wow. 341 he hit that ball. If he was young today and had, and, and had the swing he has today with this equipment, he'd be chipping back to all the par fours. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. The guy was, had the fastest left shoulder I've ever seen. That's where speed comes from. Speed comes from the left shoulder. The, the faster you can move your left shoulder out of there, in other words, the, the club's lagging. The club's following it. That's what he had. He had a, but we've been great friends. He, he's he, he, gentleman. He's one of the greatest parents I've ever met in my whole life. I learned more from him and my wife about raising kids uh, than, 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 than I did from anyone. But Jack was, Jack was very hands-on when it came to his children. I mean, he was there for everything all the time. Uh, but uh, the snake deal happened. I was actually doing cameos for Sports Illustrated before the Open started at, at, at Marion. Uh, I had the safari hat with the axe, and I had the snake out here with the axe like that, and they were taking pictures of it and ran it on, in a big thing. So that snake thing was there way before even the tournament. And I put it in the golf bag. And when we went to the playoff, and uh, when we went to the playoff, uh, I reached in. It was at 1 o'clock. It was extremely warm, high humidity, and then my glove that I had on was sweated out. So I went in the bag to pull another glove out, and the snake fell on the ground. It was in the big pocket, the rubber snake. And he's sitting about 30 feet away on this little stick seat, and he says to me, he said, what is that? <laughs> I said, it's a rubber snake. He said, where did you get that? I said, my daughter bought it at the at the uh, uh, Fort Worth Zoo, and I was doing cameos with it here. He said, throw that over here. So I threw the snake over, and he reaches down and looks at it and starts laughing, and he throws it back. Oh, my God, the media went, you know how the media, the media went absolutely nuts. They yep. went nuts. They, oh, unsportsmanlike. <laughs> how could the hell could you do this? I said, I guess that snake made him leave it in the bunker on two. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then made him leave it in the bunker on three. And then he laid the side over it on nine. I guess that snake is really getting him. I don't know. But no, he, we were not rivals. He had no rivals. Hmm. He set the bar. Played 16 tournaments a year. I remember in 1979, he was played awful. Played awful. And the media was, man, he's finished. He's through. He's this. He's that. And I remember going into the media in 79, and I said, let me I said, you really don't know, I said, you, you, you don't know much about, uh, about life, do you? And they said, what do you mean? I said, you ever been in the outdoors? I said, you ever noticed that a bear hibernates? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, have you ever gone into one of those caves and, and that boy's got a dream going on and, and he's going like this and you wake him up? You know what that bear's going to do to you? <laughs> he's going to maul you. I said, don't wake this guy up. <laughs> He woke, they woke him up. He comes back in 1980. What's he do? He wins two majors. He wins two majors right out of the bat. How about winning in 86 at 46 at, at Yeah, I won at 44. I know. Yeah. I won the, uh, the one thing that Jack and I have in common is his first tournament was a major, the U.S. Open. And my first major was, uh, was uh, uh, my first tournament win was a major, the U.S. Open. His last win uh, was was a Masters major, and my last win was a major in '84, which is the PGA. Yeah, I didn't win nearly as many tournaments. I think he won 73 tournaments, if I'm not mistaken. He won uh, 18 or 19 majors, finished second in 29 of them. Yeah. He told me he said I'd have tried a little harder if I'd have known they were going to keep a record of these things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know that that's the truth. You know, we were we were having that discussion last evening. It, it's it's the way that the the social media has done it today is that they're, uh, they, they measure you now by, in other words, uh, by majors, you know. I tried, I, I, 
my suggestion, I guess, went out the window. But I told him, I says, you know how all, people are always trying to compare uh, golfers from the old days to the new days and boxers from the old days to the new days and all this, the runners and the whole thing. Runners, I can understand uh, that you, 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 you can evaluate a runner because it's a time. You know, it's on the clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the tracks are better. The shoes are better. The knowledge of running is better. See, so I, I don't know what, what you can do there. But in golf, it's very simple. All you got to do is put a number on a win. Put a certain number on a regular win. Put a certain number on top ten. Put a certain number on making the cut. Put a certain number on majors. Then you can tell who the best player is. How, how much? You can't, you can't evaluate. Tiger Woods won. He, he, he's won a million dollars. You know, his... His, his retirement fund, when he retires, he's going to have $100 million in his retirement fund. He probably can't wait to get 60. I don't know what the hell he's going to do with all that money. But, you know, but, uh, uh, the, the two eras are, you know, you've got to go 40 years to your prime. Yeah. How much of, is, is equipment the difference in all of that? Well, it, it, I don't think the, the, the all guy, you all have it. it. It doesn't make any difference. The greatest improvement that's ever made, been made in the game of golf is the mower, <laughs> is the equipment that maintains the golf course. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest thing. I remember playing tournaments, they only mowed three times a week. They only made the fairways once a week. Hmm. They didn't rake the bunkers, they just did it with their foot. They didn't even have rakes. <laughs> I mean, they, they, I remember this. Uh, and, and today, oh, are you kidding me? They go out. <laughs> I mean, can you, on, on, uh, at the Masters, David Graham's on the cup changing at the, they're on their hands and knees getting the sand away from the cup, you know, when they put the cup in. Oh, it, it is unbelievable now. Also, golf is turning a lot like tennis. You know, tennis, you play a hard court. The making difference between Memphis, Dallas, or L.A., Spain, whatever, hard court, hard court. You play clay, 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 mm -hmm. okay? Golf courses were different. I remember coming here to Memphis, you'd have a winter kill. You remember, we didn't have any grass in the fairways. I loved it. That ball run forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. But I, 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 that's what I attribute me winning here is we came early, and, and the fairways hadn't grown yet, and my, I, could, I could make the ball run out there because it was a long golf course. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a short golf course. But the moor has done everything. In other words, they, they, they're mowing those greens sometimes twice a day. You know, in a tournament, and then they roll them. You know, they got the roller. Right. You see that roller they got? They smooth them out with the roller. I mean, you didn't have that before. The tees today are better than the greens we putted on in my day. You tell that to kids today, they don't understand it. And, and you have to understand, the great thing about golf is that younger players are all in with Tiger and Phil. You know, they have no clue who we are. We're three generations remote. I go to kids today, they want me to go, oh, you got to come to the school and talk to my kids. I said, how old are they? Ten. I said, they have no clue who the hell I am. <laughs> I think you're just going to see a white-headed guy walk in and say, who the heck is this guy? But I'll tell you what, I get a group of kids, I start looking at them, the dad says, oh, he said, this is a great golfer, son, this is Lee Trevino, and the kid looks up at me and does that, and I says, do you know who I am? No. I said, how about Happy Gilmore? And ah, yeah. He said, that's you. That all, all, the, all the young kids know me from the cameos I did on Happy Gilmore. And I wanted that's to slap incredible. their parents for letting them watch that <laughs> damn thing. Because the language in that thing is awful. I didn't know it was that bad. I'd have never done it. I would have never done it with the language in that, in that Happy Gilmore thing. Bob Barker beat the hell out of that guy. Oh, he man. Did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a million things I, I could ask you, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you what you're doing now. Well, the great thing about retirement is that you can do what you want to. And most people that retire, what do they do? They play golf. Play golf. That is what's so great about this sport. It's very difficult for me when you do that for a living. You understand what I'm saying? And then you retire. What the hell do you do? I go play football, basketball. <laughs> you know basketball? Go fishing? Well, I've, I've been trying the NBA. I, I, <laughs> I lobbied for the NBA. They, they should have one Mexican, 5'7", on every team. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, that's not right. That's At discrimination. Least that's discrimination. They got to have one Mexican on every team. You know, but I hadn't gotten that one over yet. But anyway, but I think, you know, that that's the hard thing. But the thing is, I'm, I, I hit the ground running every morning. I get up every morning at 6 o'clock, and as, as, as I tell my wife, I said, I just can't wait to wake up just to hear what I have to say. I said, I have no, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I have no idea where I'm going, how, how the hell I'm going to get there. I mean, the other day, for instance, I was telling my wife, I got two little puppies, my little dog's outside. I couldn't remember the damn dog's name to get him back in the house. <laughs> I said, what the hell's that dog's name? <laughs> but I, I, I absolutely have a blast every day. But I, I'm, I'm very involved in junior golf. And, and our foundation is, is that we, we need... I've got, uh, like in Fort Worth, I fund all these little tournaments and, and all these kids playing golf. And I want them to know about me. I want them to know a little bit about how a kid, I wasn't dealt bad cards. I was just, I was just, my family was very poor. My grandfather raised me, he was a grave digger. And uh, um, I, I, I grew up on a cotton farm. Uh, and I, virtually no education, hardly at all. And, and, and I, 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 I did it, and I, did, I wouldn't have done it in any other country but here, but I did it, and I did it simply because I had a skill. The good Lord gave me a talent. I took advantage of it, and I, I, don't, I don't let one day pass that I don't really appreciate it, and I, and I think, why me, why me, why me? And, and when the Lord gives you that type of talent, you better take advantage of it because you're going to meet him someday and, and, and you don't want him to get angry when he meets you and say, listen, I gave you something mm -hmm. and you blew it. And I, I didn't want him to do that. I have never done drugs. I smoked a little bit. I quit 28 years ago, 27 years ago. I haven't had a drink in 27 years. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very involved in, 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 in these kids, these young kids, uh, trying to get them into golf. I know the first tees trying to do their part. The PGA is trying to do their part. The USJ is trying to do their part. I think it's great what Augusta does with a chip putt uh, yeah, drive contest. Thing. I think it's just most the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life because these kids know about Augusta and they dream about it. But we have our foundation at home, and uh, uh, one of my biggest ones, I guess, is I, I fund uh, I, I fund college teams. I do, yeah, UTEP uh, and also, Texas Western and Fort Worth. Uh, I, do, I do a lot of work. Uh, one of my favorites, believe it or not, is not, it, it, it's not related to golf, uh, but it's the Austin Street Shelter. And we shelter, we, sh we, we, we sleep 500 people a night in this shelter. And then they have to leave by 9 o'clock in the morning. We clean it up, and then they come back, same ones, come back the next night. We also do um, the... Uh, uh, we, we also do, uh, uh, I, I had um, battered wives. We do a big thing there for that in Dallas. Uh, Lanny Watkins and I, in fact, mm -hmm. we've got a big pro-am coming up the 23rd. Uh, but uh, my biggest, I guess, junior program that we have is the Fort Worth one. Even though I live in Dallas, I, I, we, we sponsor the one in Fort Worth. And last year I had 508 players. And we, we, and we got to beat up the people to get the golf courses and stuff. And I'll tell you something. Colonial of Fort Worth, Hogan's yeah. Alley, donates the course for the final. Wow. Which is very exciting for these kids because they've heard so much of Colonial. And they have the tournament there each and every year. Thank but you. But that's what I do. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. We, I, I know Jeremy has another little presentation for you. So I want to call him up. Claudia, thank, thank you for bringing him. We appreciate that. Yeah. Again, thank you so much. Thank for you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, my right. pleasure. Yeah.